Yesterday we started the question over Aseret Ashvatim. As you know, part of our painful history is the exile that our people went through. And the ten tribes scattered around the world. Part of that was the issue that idol worshippers um, forcefully um, have um, all kind of uh, interaction with our people and the question raised how you treated the result of those um, um, illicit relations between those idol worshippers and um, daughters of the ten tribes so it was a notion yesterday we discussed at the very end of our session uh, on behalf of Rav Yudah Maravasi, he said that since the exile of the ten tribes, um, if idol uh, worshiper um, betrothed um, a daughter from our ten tribes, it's an issue because we don't know how those who idol worship are treated in the first place. Why? Uh, we explained yesterday it was a big uh, mixture. Uh, it wasn't which we call in the modern days a melting pot, but it was a mixture um, that uh, the evil king of Babylon, and later it was the Assyrian, that mixture the, um, the um, people, our people, with others, and Rashi tells us that's at the very end of um, page 16b, the Bura Matchil me Aseret Ashvatim hu, she nasu of dot kochavim, ve kasavar de ovedet kochavim, she aldam Israel of Lad Mamzer, ve hod shishim le kilushe Mamzer. So according to Rashi, and later we learn it in the Gemara, that it was a son, Ben Israel, and it's an issue that the child is not legitimate because we don't know what exactly happened here. It was an old mix. Uh, later, the Gemara explained that that generation, Nivka Rahman, etc. It's a, it's a yeah, discussion later we're going to talk about it. Tosfot disputed Rashi, and he said that it's the other way around, which in a way it's simpler. He said that Oved Kochavim, the idol worshiper, Habal Bat Israel, that he um, um, has a relation with uh, daughter of Israel. So we are on page 17, and it's uh, just four lines from the top of the page. So the Gemara here referred to the word of Ravasi that was said before Shmuel was a well-known sage, meaning after the passing of Ravasi, Rav Yudah went to study by Shmuel. Amarli, he said, Bincha haba mi mina Yisraeli. He said, your son who comes from a Jewish woman, it's called your son. Even the father is idol worshiper. That's based on what the Torah instructed us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7. Um, the Torah said that, that we are prohibited to marry, the daughter of us prohibited to marry the son of idol worshiper. And you, your son have an issue to marry the daughter of idol worshiper. So the, um, uh, the, one of the notion there is the whole concept of the idol worshiping. But we derive from that the whole concept of the marriage. So he said, Karui bincha, ve'en bincha ba min ha'ovedet kochavim, karui bincha el abna. So it means, here you go by the mother, 
that she is idol worshippers, and therefore it's in considering like her. So the Gemara asks, "Vehaika banot," but there are daughters of the ten tribes with children, children from the idolaters that were exiled. The Amar Ravina, Ravina said, "This is something we're going to study on page 23." Shma mina ben bincha haba min haoved kochavim karui bincha. Your daughter's son who has come from idolaters, man, it's called son, which means he's Jewish like his mother and not an idolater like his father. So here, first you should know that here we are in the concept of idol worshiper more than the whole concept of marrying out of faith. It's the concept of idol worshiper that... uh, um, uh, is the core of the discussion. For sure, there is more to discuss here. But the base on the Deuteronomy chapter 7, um, that's the way we see here the word of Ravina, is basically repeats what Shmuel said. And it's um, the way that Ritva understands it is like he tried to elaborate or explain, extrapolate what Shmuel said. Because when we use the term, your son that comes, it's me, it's appearances, your real son. And here it means that it's not necessarily son by the mean of the literal sense. And the Gemara responds, and they said, Gmirei, we receive the tradition, Divnata de Ahudara, that the son, that the daughter, meaning the, the daughter of, of that generation, which means the woman of the exile of the ten tribes, it's tarude, it's tarui, it's tarui. So that's what we said earlier, that, um, that they are torn. So um, again, um, that's one of the way that the receiving tradition rush elaborates on that. It's very painful to read it, but part of the exile if you read the story of the Holocaust in World War II, it's almost repetition of that, that uh, because people are tortured and forced to walk for long, endless um, kilometers, endless, uh, so those young women, they, according to this uh, source, the Rashi and, and more, they basically, um, uh, they torn and they could not bear children. Um, meaning um, the way they said is the womb were torn due to the agony of the of the journey into exile and they lost the capacity to conceive that's the way Rashi tells us but anyway um, the Meiri um, goes in different ways which again uh, it's it's hard for us in a modern day to, to conceptualize that one, one explanation, the Meiri said that they purposely drank, it's called Kos Shel Akarim, special um, drugs that um, avoided them from having children. And they did it on purpose in order not to have children from the idolaters. Um, another one which is even harder to understand, that uh, they make themselves look so bad so they will not have an interest in them. But anyway, um, so therefore, the, for our discussion, the idea is that you don't um, concern that those descendants, it's um, th- those idol worshipper in our times, meaning in Talmudic times, is uh, any any form of a descendants for those um, daughters of the ten tribes um, from the ancient time. So, meaning, according to Shmuel, what we understand that the idolater that uh, betrothed um, the daughter of Israel in the place that they have a um, in gathering of the, the, the or, or some population of the ten tribes, you should not be concerned of the that uh, kiddushin because it's not a descendants of those um, of that generation. 
איכא דאמרי, כי אמרית הקמי דשמואל אמר לי לא זזו משם עד שהסאום גויים גמורים, which means that um, they, they uh, basically they didn't move from there until they, they, they rendered them as a complete idolaters. And he said, because of that, שנאמר כי בהשם בגדו כבנים זרים ילדו, that's in Hoshea, chapter 5. So they, um, by use the word uh, זרים, זרים meaning alien. It means that they are implication <coughs> that they became total idolater. So since we talked yesterday about the city called Tamod and we asked a question for people on that city, Yativ Rav Yosef Achorei de Rav Kahana, Yativ Rav Kahana Kamei de Rav Yehuda, Yativ Kamar, Atidim Yisrael de Av de Yomatava ki Charvei Tamod. He said he already prophesied that uh, that city is going to uh, expand. It's going to abolish, it's no longer going to exist. So he said, if those people from that city were basically mamzeri, which means illegitimate. So he said, when that will happen, it will be a day of celebration. The hachagib, so they said, the truth is that this city of Tamor is already destroyed. So they said, it's different one. Ha'it tamod it's not tarmod, it's tamod. Another explanation, Ravashi Amar, היינו תעמוד, היינו תעמוד, אי כפו ליהודי מכפל, חריב מאי גיסא, אותיב מאי גיסא, ואי חריב מאי גיסא, אותיב מאי גיסא. Which means it was a moving of population, it's not totally purification from המזרות of that city. So the only when the entire city from both sides will be totally destroyed, then we'll celebrate. Now we have a discussion over Psulei Chitun, which means that those who are not valid because of the issue of um, legitimacy of the, their marriages. Yativ Rav Amnuna Kamei Deula Bekahave Bishmata Amar Magavra O Magavra It's a great man. He loved the Harpania Ma'atei It was a city by the name of Harpania. In those days, they have a, a book of lineage, which means um, in our modern days, there are some sites, right, David? Yep. That they give you a ancestry. Um, ancestry. <laughs> Not that ancestry. That's bad because it's, I think it's a Mormon. Yeah, it's a Mormon one. But anyway, um, they give you the ancestry. So the Harpania city, according to Rashi, was not a city of lineage. <coughs> so Rav Amuna was uh, in a way insulted that um, it's uh, embarrassing. So he said, Which city you pay taxes? It's the name of the city. So don't worry about it. You're not... Um, uh, You're not sure, you, should, you should not feel embarrassed. So they, um, it's a, a few ways to understand that discussion. Um, um, the way the Chavot Yair said, it's originally he thought it is from that city and he wants to make sure that people not marry that family. And then um, uh, he, he saw that he's embarrassed. And the Gemara in Kiddush in 71 said, But one of the nature of Mamzerut, it's Azut, which means there are people who are obnoxious or rude. That's a part of that attitude. As you see in several Gemarot, that this uh, result of uh, illicit relations, you see the, the, the child that come out, it's, um, it's not in the nature of, a, um, it's a good nature. So one of the signal is the is the consequences of that. So because he saw that he's embarrassed, he realized that um, um, he need to search the source where it comes from. My harpanya, amar abzera har she'akol ponimbo, which means people who are have the issue of uh, of um, legitimacy, which means people who 
came out of um, illicit relations and they cannot marry to a normal family, so they need to go to that place to find their mate. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's true. It's a city that anybody who doesn't know where is uh, coming from, like all these illegitimate people, they go and find their mate in that place. I'm not talking about a website. I'm talking about cities. Amar Rava. Vehi Amuka Mishol. That site, no, I'm joking. That city. I didn't know there was a city named K Date. So I said, so that city, that's our Panya, is deeper than Sheol. Sheol, it's like a grave, it's a Geinom, that's the, if you remember the Gemara in Aruvi 19. Shenemar miyad Sheol evdem mimavet egalem. Which means uh, that's expression of Geinom, that it's a limit of time. Ve'ilu psul did hu leit leutakanta. Meuvat lo yuchalit kon. Someone who come from uh, from psul yuchasin from from that relation, so that person it's uh, the entire lives it's 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 a, it's a problem. Um, meaning, you see some situation that is can rectify, but certain things. It's very psulei de harpania mishum psulei de meishon. U psulei de meishon mishum psulei de tarmon. Psulei de tarmon mishum of dei shlomo. So here they just bring all the idea of some illegitimate relations between people, that mixture between cities, and it's it's go back to what we said yesterday that it starts with the uh, servant of Shlomo, that there are violence and, and, um, and, um, and uh, involved with rape and all kind of horrible uh, behavior, and it spread from one place to another. The Hainu de Amri in Sheikh, and here they use a act of euphemism, and they said, Kaba Raba, the Kaba Zuta, Migandar, the Azil. So Rashi said here, איפה גדולה ואיפה קטנה שניהם מעוותים. כלומר כל הפסולים מתגלגלים ויורדים לשאול ומשאול את עמוד כלומר ששאול גבוה מתרמוד. So here Rashi used the כלומר twice. The first one I tried to explain in my book that it's a marshal of nimshal. It's like a using of allegory. The second one it's not necessarily the way I understand this Rashi is not necessarily in regards to punishment, but it's just saying that the Sheol is very deep. Um, to tell us that the Talmud is very low. It's uh, like warning to those miyuchasim, to those people who come from a good family, from a good lineage, that they should remain pure and not mix with, um, with the, the other people. Anyway, you're welcome to read more in the book. And he said, Lish'ol, מגנדר וזה לשאול ומשאול את תרמוד ומתרמוד למישן ומישן לארפניה הדרן הלך חמש עשרה נשים. Just some introduction before we begin this, the next beautiful chapter. There is a concept that's called זיקה. The idea of זיקה is this. It's very basic and trust me, it's simple. But you just need to zoom in with your brain over this because the moment you conceptualize that the rest will be easy. We explain before the first parak that we have a conflict which is in one place the Torah gives us in the Bilikus 18 a list of, of a relation that is prohibited. Um, the Torah called that abomination such as first stage, which is father and a daughter, etc., it's blood relatives. Then we go to the next stage, which is called Isurei Chitun, the um, prohibition that comes toward marriage, which means if your son marry a 
daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. Then we explain Shniyot La'arayot, which is mother of the mother, mother of the father, daughter of your daughter, etc. And then we explain the concept of brother, the wife of the brother that wasn't alive when that person was born. By the same token, we brought another source of a great mitzvah, the mitzvah of Levirate marriage. And we explain that the Torah commanded the man, the surviving brother, Deuteronomy 25, surviving brother of the deceased who died childless, to go ahead and marry the wife of the deceased in order to perpetuate the, um, the soul of the deceased brother who died with no children. Now, in a time in between, meaning, let's use names so it makes it simple for us. We have two brothers, Reuven and Shimon. Reuven married Rachel, and Reuven passed away. Rachel is now in a need to either have Levirate marriage with Reuven, or to have Chalitza, which means release from him to go ahead and marry out of the family. The question is, at the time being in between, can be so many circumstances, such as he's not available, he's too young, or, or all kind of things that happen in between, he's not well, all kind of situations. There is a concept in our discussion in, in Nalacha that it's called Zika. Zika, Zayn Yud Kuf Hei, it's an important word, which means there is some bond between the two, but in as, as far as the legal, the halacha, the logic involved here, the question is, is that zika, considering a marriage, a form of marriage or not? And it's a heavy disputation. Yes zika or en zika? Do you tell me that since Rachel may be the wife of Shimon, and therefore she is bound to him in a sense of, of some relationship that involves an obligation, and especially the way that you understand the biblical, the Torah text, or you tell me that it's a potential, but since that potential is not fulfilled, then it's enzika. So, Enzika meaning, she is not married to the Yavam, to, to Shimon, and not married, the next step is, you mean to say, not married neither biblically, nor rabbinic, or is any rabbinic boundaries that basically put her in a lupo, in a situation that she stuck with him at least for some time. Limbo. Limpo. Limpo. Limpo, yeah. Right. So that's basically the discussion of this chapter. So let's read a little bit the Mishnah and um, elaborate on that. Keitzad eshet achiv shelo ayah Refresh our memory. In the first parak, we discuss 15 cases of women that exempt the rival, the co-wives, from both, from Levirites, from Yibum, and release, Chalitza. Again, you have Reuven and Shimon, and Reuven, for our discussion, make it more lively. Let's say he was a young soldier. At his early 20s, he married Rachel, and he get killed, unfortunately, in Gaza, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, whatever it is. And now his brother, Shimon, basically needs to do Levirate. But this fellow Ruven, for our discussion, have more than one wife. His first wife was Rachel, and is another one, which we call co-wives, for our discussion. So we said that the moment the wife is exempt for all kind of reasons, 
and is a 15 examples. Therefore, all the others, it's also release from act of Yibum and Chalitza, and they can go ahead and marry anybody outside of that family circle. So one of the cases in the previous Mishnah was the wife of the brother that was not alive, meaning that Reuven, that soldier that get killed, the parents are still young, and they brought another son, can be, for our discussion, Levi, or even another Reuven that named after his brother by the parents. And this young baby was now an adult, right? He wasn't alive when his brother get killed or when his brother died. So they said, when is that case applied that she release also the rival wife, meaning the co-wife, from both, from Chalitza and Yibu? So they said, Shnei Yachim, if you have two brothers, for our discussion, as we said, Reuven and Shimon. Umet echad me'em, Reuven passed, childless. Can be killed, can be passed. Venolad lahem ach, and his another brother was born, when his name is Levi. And then, what happened? Levi, yibem et eshet achiv. Guess what happened? Meanwhile, Levi was born, Shimon act in a Levirite marriage toward the wife of Reuven, and then, but Shimon and also another woman, meaning Shimon was married at that time, and he Levirite, or it can be that he marry another wife. But the idea is he act in a Levirite manner toward the 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 surviving wife of the deceased, and now Shimon died childless with both wives. So the Levi here is in a situation, we ask whom we need to act in a Levirite manner, and how you do that. So they said, um, Harishona, the one that married first to Reuven, so let's call them name. Let's say Rachel, who married Reuven. Yotza, she is free from Zika. You remember the word Zika? Zika meaning some marital obligation. For our, for our discussion is Zikat Yibum, which means an act of obligation for Levirite act from Levi, from the brother who was born when, when Reuven was dead, Mishum, because Eshet Achiv Shelo Beolamo, because this is a wife of a brother who was not among the living when Levi was born. Ve'ashniya, and the wife of Shimon, which means Shimon have another wife, let's call her Tamar. So she's also childless, but she is exempt from act of Levirate marriage from the brother Levi, why? Mishum Tsarata, because she's considering a rival or co-wife of Rachel. So therefore, if Shimon did not, Yibem, did not act in Levirate marriage toward the wife of Reuven, to Rachel, only Asaba Ma'amar Vamet, which means Asaba Ma'amar, we explained it several times, it's a rabbinic idea that they have some act of Ma'aseki Dushim, which means he started the process. We explained many times that it was, in, especially in those days, a process, Lehavdil, uh, no comparison, but for some of us who are involved with other cultures, you go to Indian cultures, right? So they have a long process of marriage. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a many, many ceremonies, right? A gil. It's like three days or so, what, mm -hmm. what, what uh, Shovek said, three, four days, okay. in the ceremonies that, that separate in different times. Mm -hmm. So Ma'amar, it's the beginning of the process of bethrowing. So by the rabbinic law, there is already some type of wife-husband relationships, even if it's in an early stage. Vamet, and all of a sudden he passed before he completed the process. 
שנייה, the wife of this, the brother Shimon, חולצת, she needs, she requires חליצה, release, ולא מתייבנת. Why? So Rashi explains, since the wife of Reuven, she is basically, um, became the wife of Shimon by the rabbinic view, because it was the beginning of that process, which means that is, they have, they call in halacha, mikzat tzarat erba. She is partially have an issue of a co-wife, etc. So therefore, automatically the, the interdynamic that we explained in the previous chapter a lot is when you say that it's the list of the abomination, Leviticus 18, and when you say that it's a mitzvah to levy right, you see that it's a very sensitive um, a case in between that the moment that it's no longer act of levy right, it's already abomination. So it means that she's not exempt totally from that zikat yibum, from that any type of obligation, but, but since it was ma'amar, it was beginning of that process, so it's not um, activate biblically, but it's still, they have some, some type of commitment, so therefore um, she cannot go ahead and marry outside of the family without act of release from the, 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 that brother, that surviving brother. So now the Gemara explained to us, Amar of Nachman, Man de Tanei, the one who tell us in the Mishnah, Rishona lo mishtabesh. So the one who speaks about the first wife, she is exempt, he is not mistaken. Man de Tanei shniya lo mishtabesh. Now we elaborate. Man de Tanei, the one who holds. 17b, Rishona lo mishtabesh. My Rishona, Rishona linfila, which means that's the first one that that naflali yibum that fall to the category of yibum. Uman de tani shniya lo mishtabesh ma shniya shniya le nisuim. So so it means that you can call the wife of Reuven shniya the second one. That's basically um, the way Rashi tells. So the Gemara challenged that Milo Askin and the Ibem Achagach Kanas. I wish to have more time, but in my book on Rashi, I elaborate. Here is a Rashi that um, that needs a lot of attention. Rashi said, "Klomar Milo mitukma na me matnitin bi Ibem eshet achiv tchila." Anyway, so they said, "Ela mai shniya shniya benisuim." So now we need to rush. All right? Okay. אשת אחים שלא היה בעולמו איך הכתיבה. אמר רב יהודה אמר רב כי אמר קרא כי ישבו אחים יחדיו. That's the source of the Toronomy 25. So it means שהייתה להם ישיבה אחת בעולם פחת אשת אחים שלא היה בעולמו. Which means that the מצוות יבום is not applicable to her because she was not alive when that happened. Then we go and he said יחדיו which means מיוחדים בנחלה which means you talk about brotherhood it's not just that act of levy right, it's also involved with Yerusha, with the inheritance. You remember when we talk about the Book of Ruth and the whole story of the property involved with Plony and Boaz. Um, the moment you marry Ruth, you involve also with redeeming a piece of property that left uh, as the inheritance. So, Prat Lachim Minayim, that the brother from the mother, as far as the law of inheritance, it's not applied to him, so therefore you have a consequence Although, which is the, the mitzvah of the Levirate marriage is not applicable to him. Rabba Amar Achiv Mina Av, Yalif Achva Achva Mibnei Yaakov. There is a um, verbal juxtaposition, verbal analogy using the word Achva when it's come to the um, text of the brothers of Jacob when they appear before Yosef in Egypt. So they said, we are 12 brothers. Bnei Avinu, Malalan Mina Avelo Minaem, which means they are brothers only from the father, not from the mother. So Afkan Mina Avelo Minaem. Remember when we talked in the first chapter, we said that the whole law of Leverage applied to brotherhood from the father only. Because the Torah used the word a a erva, Eshet Achi Chalot Egalein, Leviticus 18 the nakedness of the wife of your brother you shall not 
uncovered so it means that it applies to from the mother and not from the father danim achim achim ven danim achim meachifa which means you, lie, you use a verbal analogy from the same word which is brothers and not from the word achim from, uh, and the word achicha מאין אף קמינא דתנא, הדנא דבר רבי ישמעאל, ושבה כאן ובאה כהן זו ישיבה וזו יביאה. That's something we learn in several places in the Shas, this is Leviticus 14. The Torah speaks about um, the word ושב and ובאה. That it looks the same, but it's different. So therefore you can learn the same concept here, the word אחים and אחיך. So they said, זו ישיבה Zoe Bia, which means returning and coming, convey the same meaning, so you should try to make it here. So say Adam Ilech had like a midet with Damile. Which means uh, you, you don't have the same words that you can use. Abalecha de Ika Mid Damile, which means the achim that you use for the Yibum, because you find the same with the sons of Yaakov. Medamelili Alfina, you learn from the one who's the same. Belaila Fahvah Vamilot, because this Lot was a son of brother of Abraham. And they use the word achim there, the chtiv, ki anashim achim anach we said in Bereshit in Genesis 13. So you should learn from that verbal analogy that they are, the, the uh, yavam can go by the wife of the brother of his father. So they said, Mr. Abra al bnei Yaakov avale lemeil of nishum de mufnei. Because they, they, it was a purpose that it's available for exposition. Because they should say, you servants are twelve, the sons of our father. So you learn from that, that make this achim available for this gzera So you derive from here that Yibum applies specifically for the father, the parental brothers. וכתית אם הלא מופנה, לאי אי אפנו מופנה, מדעה וכתיב לרעים, וכתיב אחים, שמע מינה לאפנו אי, כתב אחמנה יחדיו, ואחים מוכנים לנחלה. So, so, here you compare two different concepts to each other, which means that this apply to brothers that have the right to inherit the property, which means that this is a brother only from the father, that they inherited together, the, the, the inheritance of the father, but not uncle or the son of the brother that they don't share. So it means that they, we derive from sons of Yaakov what we said the first paragraph, that the whole law of Leverite marriage applied to what? Brothers from the father. How do you derive it? So it means, how do you derive, derive the idea that the brothers should be both father and mother. Yibum benachalat la rachmana, because the Torah basically put together the law of Levite marriage, the law of nachala, law of inheritance, from one another. I see that I have to rush. Okay, so um, they benachala uh, minahav <coughs> velo minahem. So the the inheritance is dependent purely upon a parental relationship and not maternal relationship. So they said, Yitzrich. So how, how do you think that the mitzvah of uh, Levite marriage applies only that um, um, uh, 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 can go both ways, father and mother? So they say, Yitzrich, Sagar Chamina, Hoil Chidush, which means to allow, to have a Levite marriage to wife of the brother is something that it's Chidush, which means it's a novel concept. The Kamishtare Erva Gabei, that all of a sudden it's not part of the list of something that's forbidden, but it's permitted regarding him. Eima ad demiyachadei be'aba uve'ima. I should say that it's not permitted unless he and the deceased share the same father and the same mother. So, so the, the uh, meaning for the sake of Yibum, the Torah lifted the prohibition. Uh, so, he, um, so the closest relative can do it, Tzricha. So therefore you need Ixera Shabbat, the word Achim, that said that the brother, it's only applied to brother from the father, and not um, act in right marriage to the wife of the brother. Now we go to a new subject, 
which I don't think we have much time today, but we, at least we get the vignette, we get the beginning, the start. Amaravim Amarav Shomeret Yavam Shemeta Mutar Be'ima. Meaning, you have here a situation that this woman waiting for her Yavam. And all of a sudden, at the time period while she's waiting, she passed. So, if it's before the act of Yibum or Chalitza, so he can go ahead and that Yavam, that fellow, married her mother. Uh, because we don't hold that that waiting Yavama is any concept of wife. Um, because if she's wife, then the relatives are prohibited to him even after the passing. But since we don't consider that wife, therefore he can go ahead and marry her mother. Alma Kasavar Enzika. So you mean to say, that's what we have in our original discussion, the relationship, it's called Kesher Ishut, the relationship between the Yavam and Yavama, it's not in order to consider her as Arusa, as betrothed for that Yavam, so therefore, the mother of that Yevama are not prohibited to him by calling her mother-in-law. You have to remember that mother-in-law meaning they married, and the in-law are prohibited from the Yisroi Chitun, from the second degree, the second level. But here, it's not since she passed before he did it. Velei Malacha Kedivrei Omer Ein Zika. So maybe you hold that the halacha follows the one who said there is no zika bond. So, so that's basically what we learn um, both here and the Gemara on page 41. So they said, Ihava amar hache hava amina anemile bitrei, aval bechad yesh zika. So here you said that there are two brothers or more that can act and liberate marriage. That's relevant. That's the way that Rabbi Yudha ben Beitera speaks. But it's only one brother, so therefore it's a different story. It's, you say that you have a Zika born, and therefore uh, Rav Huna uh, states unequivocally that when a woman awaiting Yibum dies, the Avam is permitted to marry her mother. So it's referred even the case where there's only one Yavam. So the Gemara asks, "V'leim alacha k'divrei Omer en zika afilu bechad." So maybe the alacha follow the one who says that there is no zika born, even if it's only one yavam. And again, I do not have the time in my book. I elaborate here on Rashi. Rashi said, "Rabbi Akiva k'amar lebeperek Rabba Achim." That's in page 29b. Shomeret yavam en yavama. So the concept here that Rashi tried to tell us is um, um, one of the things that the, the Torah allows or requires the husband is to annul vows. And the question is if you call this man a husband or not. And one of those things is the idea that if he cannot annul her vows, so he doesn't have any concept halachically speaking, of, of husband, and therefore um, uh, it's not applicable here. So that's basically, you're welcome to read more in my book. I elaborate on that. So they said, which means that that Yivama, that is still waiting for him. Only after the passing, um, um, uh, after the Yivama death, is permitted to marry her mother. But Mechayim, but during the life, the Yevama lifetimes, uh, while she's waiting for Yibum Ochalitza, he is not allowed to marry a mother. Mishur de Asu Levatel Mitzvat Yevamim, because it's forbidden to negate the mitzvah incumbent upon Yevamim. So I wish to have more time, but basically, um, the moment that the Zika is over, then it cannot do much, but that's basically rabbinic law. It's not biblical. So in, in short, what Ravuna hold that the only act of zika bond, it's not enough to prohibit the Yavam to marry the relative of the Yavama, um, because it's basically mafkia legambre misvat yibum. It's basically 
totally um, abrogate it, totally expand the mitzvah of Levite marriage. Shuloim, Malachai, Shuloim, Malachai.